Hi folks, this is Fide Master Kostya Kowitski, and today I'll be continuing my series for Chess University on mastering the endgame principles. Today I wanted to cover a pretty famous principle that should be known by all endgame players, and that is the idea of putting your rook behind the passed pawn. This is a pretty classic example here in front of you, and it's kind of simplified, and I think it'll illustrate the point well of why when you're playing a single rook endgame, you usually want to keep your rook as much as you can behind your passed pawn. So in this case, white should try to get his rook to b1 as quickly as possible. And if it was black to move, black would need to play rook b2. So in this position, it was indeed white to play, and he played rook b1. And we'll see very soon why putting the rook behind the passed pawn is actually its best placement. By the way, this was a game between two very strong players. Playing white is former world champion Mikhail Botvinnik, and his opponent here is Grandmaster Bolslavsky, another very, very strong player from the Soviet Union. So after rook b1, white is ready to push this pawn forward, and black, in order to stop this pawn, is going to have to make his own rook very, very passive. For example, after rook c6, b5, and rook b6, black has to blockade the pawn on the rook, and now this rook has very limited mobility. So something very similar happened to this in the game. Black actually played king f7 here. White pushed, king e6, white pushed again, and rook c8. Now if you're trying to win this position with white, the important thing to remember is that you need to use your king very much in this position, almost as much as you're using the rook. So pushing b7 here would be a mistake, and we'll come back to why in just a bit. But Bavinik plays this well, he plays h3, black plays rook b8, and he brings his king in. King d5, king g3, king c6, and king g4. And here we kind of reach the critical point of why having the rook behind the passed pawn is so powerful. Now since white's king has been activated, and if you watch this series you know of course the power of the active king, now black can't afford to take this pawn on b6 and exchange rooks because white will be winning in the ensuing king and pawn endgame. So rook takes b6, rook takes b6, king takes, king f5, king c6, king e6, and white wins. The king just comes into f7, snags both the black's pawns, and with two extra pawns, white has a very easy route to victory. So going back, black did not take the pawn here. That would lead to an immediate loss, and instead played king b7, trying to blockade the pawn with the king and free the rook up to move over. So going back to this position here, this is the key moment where white played h3 to bring his king in. Had white played b7, this would have been a little bit too rash, and here white is kind of over pushing because now black might be in time to actually take this pawn and then return with the king just in time to prevent white's king from entering. So when playing this kind of endgame, it's important not to push the pawn too quickly as black will simply pick it up and then have time to bring his king over to the king side. That's why bringing your king in is such a better strategy in this kind of endgame. So here black played king b7, and now Botvinnik finds a very, very strong maneuver, rook e1. And this point is that he's going to put the rook on e6, where it'll be even more active than it is on b1. And now if black takes the pawn, well, this allows white to exchange the rooks with the rook b1 check. And after we trade rooks, white's king gets in and will win the game. So black played rook g8. And he's trying to defend against the pawn with his king and uses rook to defend his king side. Rook e6, king a6, king g5, king b7. And here comes the final breakthrough, h4. Basically, white's king and rook are going to outplay black single rook on the defense here, and Botvinnik uses his h-pawn to open some squares up for his king. 
black sets, white advances, and h6. Takes, rook takes, now white is going to win the h pawn and use his g pawn to win the game since black's king is stuck over here on b7. King a6, rook c6, rook e7, rook c7. Very nice move. Check, g5, king takes pawn, rook takes h7. And here black's king is simply too far away to deal with the ad advanced g pawn. King c6 was played, king h6, and g6, and rook f7. Nice move, cutting off the king. White's king is going to run to g7 and g8, and we'll get the famous Lucina endgame. And white here has a very clear theoretical win. King e6, rook f2. And white slowly advanced. And here we get the key position. If you know how to build the bridge here, good. If not, you really need to learn this technique. Rook e2 check, king d7. Rook e4. And black could simply resign here since after white's king comes out, black's rook can give a number of checks, but eventually white will use his rook to block and do what's called building the bridge. So, this idea of putting the rook behind the pass pawn is very, very powerful because when black's rook has to defend passively against it, this rook on b6 simply cannot do anything, and all white needs to do is bring his king into the game and either head to the queen side and support the pawn, or if black's king is over here, switch to the king's side as we saw in this game, and win by taking black's pawns on that side of the board. So if you've got an extra pawn in rook end games and it's a pass pawn, try to get your rook behind the pawn, push it forward, activate your king, and then create the second weakness on the king's side, and you'll be able to win the game that way. Thanks a lot for listening. As always, click the take the quiz button to head to our site and take an additional quiz regarding the material. And if you want to see more videos from our channel, please hit subscribe as well. Thanks so much for tuning in. This has been Vide Master Kosti Kowitski, and I'll see you next time.